Dale Carnegie often said, The sweetest sound in the world is a person's own name. Welcome to the A&P Professor, a few minutes to focus on teaching human anatomy and physiology with host Kevin Patton. In this episode, I revisit adult brain neurogenesis, finding media to use in teaching, and using eponyms plus a brief discussion about what we call our students. Well, here's a topic that just keeps coming up, and I think that's what makes it interesting and fun, and that is the topic of whether adult brains can make new neurons. That is, are we doing neurogenesis in the brain as adults? And for a long time, the um, common thinking on this was that, no, once you reach adulthood, actually long before you reach adulthood, probably most of the time after birth, you're not really making new brain cells. You're unconnecting and reconnecting brain cells in order to achieve the plasticity that is necessary for normal human brain function. And then, more recently, the idea started growing that, yeah, we can do neurogenesis in the adult brain. And uh, back in episode eight, I brought up some recent research that claimed to prove that, no, that's really a mistake, that we really can't continue to make new neurons uh, into and through adulthood. And then I came back in episode 14 with. Uh, some additional evidence that showed, oh, yeah, we can. And that probably what's going on in our understanding is that the neurogenesis that occurs primarily in the hippocampus of the brain is, um, you know, it's, it's not even. We're not producing the same number of new neurons throughout the entire developmental period. It's very prolific, of course, during, um, you know, embryonic and fetal development. And then it slows down uh, once we're born. And it gets so slow once we're into adulthood that it's not likely to really be easily observed, Um, at least not in all the areas of the brain. But as you and I well know, there's still a lot of work yet to be done in terms of visualizing what's really going on in the brain. We're making leaps and bounds in that area, certainly, and and that is really tipped off just an explosion of growth and understanding the human brain. But we're still not, you know, at a point where we know even close to everything that's going on. And there was another recent bit of research that came out in the journal Cell that uh, has identified a population of stem cells from which neurons, new neurons, continue to be produced in the adult hippocampus, actually throughout the lifespan. Now, one issue with this is that this work was done in mice, so it still needs to be confirmed in humans. And mice have a different pattern of development, a different kind of uh, lifespan than humans do. So odds are there are going to be some differences, but there are probably more similarities than there are differences. We're going to have to wait and see. And so this kind of adds some additional evidence that, yes, we are doing neurogenesis in the adult brain, and we're getting closer to understanding exactly how that might be working. So it's just an update here. And it kind of gets to the topic that I was discussing in episode 37, and that is the idea of the last best story. As I mentioned then, I use that phrase a lot in my teaching. And I tell my students that, yes, our understanding of human structure and function changes because we get better technology. We refine the way we ask and answer questions in the experimental method. Uh, 
we start to pull together information that maybe has been out there for a while, but hasn't yet been pulled together and compared and contrasted in ways that give us more insights. So the story get, keeps getting better and more clear. And as the story develops, sometimes we eh, throw away uh, an idea and then pick it up again later and realize that we shouldn't have thrown it away in the first place. And it might go back and forth a few times. And well, that's just what makes science fun, in my opinion. This podcast is sponsored by HAPS, the Human Anatomy and Physiology Society, promoting excellence in the teaching of human anatomy and physiology for over 30 years. Go visit HAPS at theapprofessor.org slash HAPS. That's H-A-P-S. I'm going to be giving a workshop on using running concept lists at the annual conference in Portland this May. It's tentatively scheduled in the last time slot of the last day of the conference. So make sure you plan to stick around until the very end so you don't miss anything. Those of you who are longtime listeners to this podcast may remember way back to episode 28 when I had a conversation with my friend Barbara Waxer, who's a media expert, and she was giving us advice on how to find media to use in our AMP course. You know, photographs, illustrations, video, audio, all kinds of things. And she also gave us some good advice on how to use it properly. Well, Adam Rich, whose name you've heard before because he's contributed some ideas and questions to this podcast before, was recently listening to episode 28, and he noticed that in the show notes there was a link to Barbara Waxer's website, where she has a list of curated collections where you can easily find some media to use in teaching. But it crosses many different disciplines. It's not focused just on anatomy and physiology. So Adam was wondering, is there a resource that is a little more focused on anatomy and physiology? And he was considering, you know, putting together something like that himself, but points out that that's a huge project. And actually, in the olden days at the ampprofessor.org, I had a list of many different images and other kinds of resources that I was curating, and it just got to be too big. So Adam's right. It's, <laughs> it's a huge project, and it's one that's not really very sustainable, at least not For somebody like me who's doing a million different things and um, just doesn't have time for that kind of a project. If somebody is interested in spearheading something like that, we'd all love to see that, me included. But until we have that, there is something that Barbara did for us right after she did our podcast. And that is she did put together a few resources that are more specific to anatomy and physiology. And what I did with that is I put it into a PDF document and added that to the bonus content that's on the TAP Radio app. Remember, TAP, T-A-P-P, stands for the A&P Professor. And you may recall that there is an app. So you can listen to this podcast, you know, on the episode page or in iTunes or Apple Podcasts or, you know, Stitcher or Overcast or any one of a million different places where you can listen to podcasts, even on a lot of the radio apps like Spotify and iHeartRadio and so on, um, you can listen there. But if you listen on the app, you also get some bonus content, usually in the form of PDF files and things that you might be able to access in a few other places, but it's really handy having it there right in the app. So that's been there for a while, and my intent was to eventually make that into a web page at theampprofessor.org and then start adding to it. And Adam, you know, sort of gave me a good idea of allowing people to contribute to that. So it's not just me curating it. It's all of us curating it. So I've finally gone ahead and done that. There is a page now up at the APprofessor.org. Just put the APprofessor.org slash media, and it should take you there. And I also have a link in the show notes and episode page that'll take you there as well. And I have a table there that's going to list Um, the contributions from Barbara. There's a handful that I have added in there. And there's also a contact form that you can access there where you can contribute 
um, some of your ideas on where are some places that all of us who teach anatomy and physiology or anatomy or physiology, uh, where we can go and find some good, useful, um, curated collections of media of all kinds. So uh, take a look at it. I'm sure you have some favorites you're already using. Please, please, please go ahead and fill out the form and let's let's populate that with some really golden nuggets um, that uh, are going to help our colleagues in their teaching of A&P. That's what this podcast is all about, right? It's a community effort. A searchable transcript and captions for the audiogram of this episode are funded by AAA, the American Association of Anatomists, at anatomy.org. Hey, are you listening to this episode while you're at the experimental biology meeting in Orlando? Maybe enjoying one of the many sessions and other activities sponsored by AAA? Maybe you're at an anatomy podcast listening party right now hearing this. (laughs) If so, why not take a moment to tell a colleague about this podcast? In our last episode, that is episode 40, I was talking about eponyms, that is terms that are named after people. An example I gave was the Broca area or Broca's area uh, in the brain, named after Paul Broca. And I made an aside that he had massive sideburns. And I mentioned that because I was using an illustration, a portrait of Paul Broca, and he did have massive sideburns. I mean, they are impressive. And so it just kind of popped out of my mouth. And it wasn't until after I had recorded episode 40 that I realized that talking about sideburns, sideburns is in itself an eponym. I should have made a point of that. So I am now. <laughs> it, it, they're named after a Union general during the American Civil War A.E. Burnside. And so people started calling that growth of hair along the side of one's face sideburn. So they kind of, you know, flipped around his name, but that is who it's named after, A.E. Burnside, General A.E. Burnside. And, um, you know, oh, I think we have a phone call. Hello, Dr. Patton. Uh, Mike Pasco from the University of Colorado. I just finished listening to your podcast episode on eponym use in anatomy um, and clinical practice, and it couldn't be more timely. Um, as you know, you uh, put this episode past me in response to a tweet that I issued recently, and this is just the concept that comes up every semester that I teach, regardless of the healthcare profession population. I'm working with, and I'm always interested in checking my opinion against uh, the opinions of my colleagues. So, of course, I'm happy to hear that you support my view, and I I do agree with you that more uh, healthcare education professionals can learn about the descriptive terms the better, and uh, the quicker the anatomy educators can adopt these practices, the quicker that they'll be adopted. So... Thanks for sharing your viewpoints in a very intentional and organized manner. And I do want to say that there needs to be some resources out there that allow people to easily um, cross-reference eponyms. So think of this as being that pocket dictionary you take with you on your backpacking trip across Europe, right? So uh, one that I use is a web-based one. It's called anatomicalterms.info. And basically, it's the Terminologia Anatomica put into a web form, and what it allows for is cross-referencing. So you can search for the ligament of trites, and you can see that this is the suspensory ligament of the duodenum. You get the Latin. You get often many other foreign language translation for the structure. But it's really handy if you hear an eponym and you have no idea what that is, descriptive, uh, descriptively speaking, you can punch that in and get your search results. Or if you think there was an eponym for the cerebral arterial circle, you can search that, and then you'll find Circle of Willis um, listed there as well. So, again, thanks for the excellent primer on eponyms, 
and toponyms and uh, everything in between. And I look forward to digging into the backlog of podcast episodes that have flown under my radar. Well, thanks, Mike, for calling in. And, um, you know, the first thing I want to mention is that Mike said that he wasn't yet aware of this podcast until I shared a link to the eponym episode in response to a tweet that he had sent out regarding eponyms just around the time that the episode was released. There are a lot of our colleagues who haven't heard about this podcast yet, even if a few notices have flown past them. So why not take the chances you get to send a link to a colleague who may be interested in a topic that we discuss here, like eponyms, for example. The more folks we can bring into this conversation, the more fun it is for everyone, right? So I really appreciate Mike calling in and his enthusiasm for our podcast. And I also really appreciate the uh, resource that he offered us. That is the website anatomicalterms.info. And I have a link to that in the show notes and episode page. If you didn't quite get that all jotted down right now or can't quite remember what it is later on. And I checked this out, and it's really a great resource. Not just for us as teachers, but a great resource to share with our students. They're going to run into eponyms they've never heard of in later courses and in their clinical careers, right? If they've already bookmarked this resource, they'll have a handy way to figure things out when they're stumped. It's like Mike said, it's just like having a phrase book when you're traveling on your foreign adventures. I'm thinking it may not be a bad idea to actually open it up on the classroom screen and take a look at it and explore it a little bit and tell students to take a moment right then in class to find it on their device and bookmark it or maybe make it into a little small group activity. Uh, Maybe. Uh, give them a couple of questions um, that they need to figure out, you know, what this <laughs> somewhat obscure eponym is before they can answer the question. Just to kind of give them practice in encountering strange and new eponyms and, you know, how to quickly find, you know, what in the world <laughs> is being talked about when that happens. That's just a thought. If you try this, though, let me know how it goes. Let us all know how it goes. Call in on the podcast hotline. And, okay, blame me if your students come after you with pitchforks because they don't like it. But I think that they would find that to be kind of a fun activity. Now, as Mike mentioned in his call, he and I have struck up a conversation through Twitter messaging. And in that conversation, he brought up an interesting point. I had suggested using both the descriptive term and eponym in our teaching. That was a suggestion I had made in episode 40 on eponyms. So I thought we should at least do that for terms where the eponym is still in wide use. And I further suggested that we use the descriptive term as the primary term in our course but at least expose our students to the eponyms. Well, Mike was wondering about the cognitive load this might place on our students. Now, if you're not familiar with the term cognitive load, it refers to the amount of working memory resources that you're using at the moment. The more working memory you have to use, the higher the cognitive load. The higher the cognitive load, the more likely you'll reach your limit of what you can handle in your thinking and learning at that moment. And there are different factors that affect cognitive load limits. You know, what is that maximum? And that includes factors that impact or appear in individuals differently. So we can't say exactly where the cognitive load is for any one person at any one moment. So, as teachers, we don't want to skate too close to the maximum, not knowing really what that maximum is for all our students anyway. Because if we do that, we might be losing some learning opportunities. 
and maybe be causing some headaches or at least some anatomy anxiety. And we don't want to do that. That doesn't help learning at all. So we do need to be aware of cognitive load in a variety of areas in teaching. So if we use just the descriptive terms, then maybe the cognitive load is more manageable, right? If we just leave out the eponyms entirely, and that's certainly a reasonable option. I mean, after all, A and P, or even just anatomy alone, presents a really, really, really high cognitive load as it is. Even if we pare it down to its barest minimum, it's less is more essentials. It's still a pretty big cognitive load we're placing on our students when they're in our course, just taking everything into account at any one moment that they're working in our course. Isn't that bilingual approach where we expose students to the eponym as well as the descriptive term adding even more cognitive load? Perhaps unnecessarily? Yeah, that's a good question. (laughs) I have no idea what the right answer is. Well, okay, I do know the best answer. And that is, there is no best right answer. There are a lot of variables there, aren't there? And until someone does the research, which I think will confirm that there's no one right answer anyway, that's, you know, all we got. But I think the question is much more important than any answer we come up with anyway. That is, the cognitive load question is something we should be asking about everything we do in our courses, from initial course design to the content of each lesson or module, to everything we ask our students to tackle. Everything. When we're mindful of that question, we can make choices that benefit student learning, right? At least we're getting closer to doing the best job of it. So as I go forward, I'm going to try to be more mindful of this question of cognitive load as I offer my students some eponyms to consider in my courses. I never give all the possible eponyms anyway, but I'm certainly going to be more careful using them minimally, and only when they're helpful, when I think there's an eponym that they're likely to encounter and likely to be confused by at some later point in their experience. Another aspect that this whole question has brought up for me is our role as educators in forming the content of our discipline. And I know in science, we like to think that what forms the content of anatomy and of physiology and of combined anatomy and physiology is the research that's going on. And, and yeah, I, I agree with that, and I understand that, and I think that's a reasonable way to look at things. But I think it's also important to look at what we're doing as educators in forming, I don't know, the, the corpus, the body of knowledge that we're training our students in. I mean, isn't it up to us educators to organize things in a way that makes sense? so that people can understand it? I mean, aren't we involved at least somewhat in that process of putting labels on things? I mean, our body doesn't come with labels. I mean, we could, you know, I mean, this whole eponym thing points out that there's a lot of different ways to name body parts, for example. You can name them after people. You can name them after places. You can name them based on some descriptive terminology of where they're at or what they do or something or what they're connected to or something like that. I mean, there are a lot of ways to do that. And the, the descriptive term I come up with might be a different descriptive term than you come up with. So part of that, we're doing an education. I mean, we're contributing to that. And we're contributing to passing it along, at least. You know, we're choosing which system we're going to pass along. And that affects all of science. That, that affects how science is communicated in anatomy and physiology, or any science for that matter. But not only that, we're 
also looking at the best way to group things together, group concepts together, group structures together, group functions together, even down to the point of, you know, which part of the story is more likely to come before which other part of the story. And those kinds of decisions that we make as educators affect how people understand concepts. At least that's my belief. Now, this idea recalls in my mind a conversation I had many years ago with Ian Whitmore, who was chair of what was then called the Federative Committee on Anatomical Terminology, and that is the body that produced the international list called Terminologia Anatomica, or TA. That's the list that Mike Pasco just referred to in his call, and it's considered to be a, a standard, an international standard. I usually just refer to that in some of the related lists as the international lists, but they are a standard. And so I called him up and was asking him some questions related to that. And this was quite a while ago when this was all kind of a new idea. And during that conversation, he made a really good point that kind of supports this opinion that I'm I'm throwing out there. He said that if we as educators can get folks to adopt a more accurate and uniform terminology, and of course, in his mind, that would ideally be the list that his committee had just produced. When we educators do that, we're playing a key role in how science is communicated. It's up to us if we want to make descriptive terms the preferred way of communicating rather than eponyms. So let's be activists. (laughs) Let's join in on that and let's do that. I'm not saying we should not ever mention eponyms or not ever use them, but I think as we do, we need to point out that this is not the best way to do it. And this is an older way of doing it. And yes, we're going to still encounter it because we're in a time of transition now. And that's kind of what I was getting at in the last episode as well. Now, in order to be taken more seriously as an educator, I'm really considering adding some big, huge, bushy sideburns to my look. I'm really thinking that I'll look more like a respected professor then, right? (laughs) Okay, maybe not. That's a dumb idea. Maybe the Van Dyke I wear now does that job okay. Oh, wow. Van Dyke? That's another eponym for facial hair. Actually, what I wear is more of what I would call a Mark McGuire. Or at least that's what we call it in the St. Louis area where I live. Okay, all of these eponyms are overloading my cognition. Let's just end things right there. Distribution of this podcast is sponsored by the Master of Science in Human Anatomy and Physiology Instruction, the Happy Degree. You know, most of us take a twisting and winding road before arriving at our AMP teaching roles. If you want to explore an online graduate program that can fill in the gaps in your content expertise and your knowledge of current teaching practice, check it out at nycc.edu slash happy, that's H-A-P-I, or click the link in the show notes or episode page. We've been talking a lot about eponyms lately, haven't we? Those are terms based on personal names, but I want to take a few minutes to talk about personal names themselves, specifically student names. At the beginning of this episode, I quoted Dale Carnegie as saying, the sweetest sound in the world is a person's own name. And I agree with that. I think that when we use student names and we pronounce them correctly and we take the extra effort and trouble it takes to not only work on remembering their names, but also work with them to get the pronunciation correctly, I think that means something to students. I think that shows students that their personal identity is important to us, and therefore they, as a person, are important to us. Now, I don't always get it right. As a matter of fact, I frequently don't get it right. Because, as we know, in order to learn something for the long term, we have to practice it 
space it out, forget it, practice it again, relearn it, space it, practice, space, practice, before it really gets into our long-term memory. So I don't always remember my student names for long-term. I don't always remember the correct pronunciation. But I do encourage my students to help me with that so it does go into my long-term memory. I also tell them how I struggle with that. And so I encourage them in later months and years, if they see me out and about in the community, to please come up and say hi and tell me how they're doing. But start it off with reminding me what their name is using the correct pronunciation, of course. And I will probably remember that they were in my class. I'll probably remember what they look like and probably remember where they usually sat in class and some other things about them. But the name part of it, that's going to be the last thing to come back into my memory, if it comes back at all. So I ask for their help with that. But I think just showing the effort of trying to do that, of acknowledging the importance of that, really helps build that connection of trust between me and the student. And the more There is that kind of connection and that realization by students that I want to make the extra effort to be present to them, then they're going to trust my advice and my help in their learning. So it's a win win situation, I think. Now, there's another aspect to that that is new to me, and I think it's new to all of us, and that is which pronouns we use. Going forward, I've made a commitment to introduce myself at the beginning of every course, not only with my name and how I prefer to be addressed as their teacher, but I will also tell them that the pronouns that I use are he and his. In order to open the door and invite students to tell me which pronouns they prefer. Now, I know I'm going to have the same struggles that I have with learning their personal names. If their pronouns that they use are something that wouldn't have come to me immediately. But I'm willing to make that effort. And I think if I make that effort at recognizing a student's own personal identity and connecting with them on that level, showing them that respect, I think that's going to improve the teacher student relationship. I think that's going to improve the learning environment. And just, I think, as a person, it's going to make both of us happier as we interact with each other. So, something to think about going forward. Hey, don't forget that I always put links in the show notes and at the episode page at theapprofessor.org in case you want to further explore any of the ideas mentioned in this podcast. And don't forget to call in with your question, comments, and ideas at the podcast hotline. That's 1-833-LION-DEN or 1-833-546-6336. Or send a recording or written message to podcast at theapprofessor.org. The A&P Professor is hosted by Kevin Patton professor, blogger, and textbook author in human anatomy and physiology. Until you know how it affects you, be careful when driving a motor vehicle or operating machinery when listening to this podcast.